First up, as we promised, you know how every monsoon we hear about rising dengue cases taking place across the country? It turns out that now students and professors in a massive study have cracked the code on predicting these outbreaks way in advance. Researchers from the Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology in Pune, along with global experts, have developed a dengue early warning system. It gives a two-month heads up before any outbreak takes place. How does it work? The model looks at temperature rainfall and humidity because remember dengue thrives in very very specific weather conditions so one of those is warmth above 27 degrees just the right amount of rain and humidity between 60 to 78 percent that's where you really see dengue exploding but if it rains too much so it's actually a question of too little and too much if it rains too much over 150 mm in a week then you actually see that dengue is washed away what we means is, what we mean is the rain actually washes away mosquito eggs, larvae and that actually ends up lowering cases. So the study that we're taking a look at today, it is path-breaking research and it even brings a stern warning with it that we'll be talking about. That we're actually going to see dengue deaths jump by 13% in 2030, up to 40% by 2050 if temperatures keep rising and monsoons stay unpredictable. Now we're going to talk a little bit more about the long-term repercussions because this study looks at exactly that but we want to tell you that this is such exciting news because this AI powered model will change the game with better data sharing from health departments that will hopefully take place cities across India could get custom dengue forecasts so they could be prepared when this takes place and this study isn't just relevant to dengue it can actually be applied to other cases too which is just what makes this so exciting so to get you what the science is to speak to the experts behind this we'll stop We'll tell you what the experts have to say. Let's ask Professor Roxy Matthew. He's with us this morning to shed light on all of this. Uh, Professor Roxy, thank you for joining us here. I know you told us that we should call you Roxy, so we're going to do that for the next few minutes. Can you first tell us a little bit, before we get to the science behind any of this, just tell us what for you was the triggering point? Why you decided that this is something worth researching, studying and developing? Well, good morning, Toya. Uh, I am totally happy that we are here on this important discussion. Uh, it's quite important. I mean, it's a quite good news as well that we are having an early warning system. Some answers to, you know, uh, <clears throat> quite uh, important questions on how Tengu is affecting millions of people. Uh, millions of people are affected on a yearly basis uh, in India. India, is, India has one third of the Tengu burden. Uh, if you look at it on a global basis so this itself was a trigger for us to look into you know what causes dengue whether we can have access on uh, you know predicting it much in advance and also uh, see if you can craft policies for the future as well and one of the uh, i would say many of my friends relatives and uh, even my wife recently got uh, admitted uh, due to dengue case. In fact, she was in uh, the hospital for five days. Hmm. And this shows that even as a climate scientist, you don't, uh, you know, you, you don't escape from the uh, uh, impacts of this kind of climate sensitive diseases like dengue and other, other kind of diseases. She was in the ICU for three days. Yeah. So all this means that it affects, uh, you can't escape from this kind of impacts, especially in a tropical country like India, where uh, there are so many uh, tropical diseases which are directly impacted by climate, the climate variability, uh, especially the monsoon rainfall, the temperatures, ideal temperatures for mosquito breeding and, and, and so on. Yeah, so this triggered uh, us to study this and we found that there aren't much studies because uh, scientists generally work in silos. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Uh, uh, in, in, in the narrow areas of research. So as a climate scientist, generally I work in the climate sphere only. The medical uh, fraternity work in their field. So there has to be someone working transdisciplinary, looking at the impacts of climate on the health, health, uh, you know, health diseases and so on, so that we can work on and provide uh, early warning systems and predictions and projections so that we, we can uh, tweak or you know, uh, work around our society so that for the betterment of the healthcare system. Mm. 
can we ask you just about how you set up the study in the first place? I know that a lot of data was needed just to track when den dengue was breaking out over the last few years. Was that an easy process? Do institutions share data very easily? Tell us about setting up the experiment first. It's never an easy process. It took us uh, three, four to five years to, you know, uh, get to this stage. Uh, getting the data itself was a tough uh, task. You know, generally the health departments, they are shy to uh, share the health data, uh, probably because they are uh, a bit uh, scared that the healthcare system will be put in the bad light because, okay, uh, this year there were so many deaths or so many cases and this is because of the, uh, you know, uh, neglig ne uh, negligence of the health, uh, the health departments and, and so on. But uh, that is not what, our, what we are aiming to do. What we are aiming to do is to see the, uh, you know, the climate related variability of uh, these uh, diseases and uh, provide an early warning system for them, which will be beneficial actually for the health department and for the government actually. Hmm. So we approached several health departments. Uh, uh, so I work in Maharashtra, within Maharashtra, in, uh, we approached Kerala, which is a hot spot for dengue. So mm. we saw that, uh, okay, in 2023, there are, they were like, Kerala was in the top uh, with 153 deaths and several uh, tens of thousands of cases, whether it's Kerala, Maharashtra, West Bengal has a lot of cases, but then uh, for some of the years, there is no data coming out of the state at all. Mm. Yeah. So at the end, uh, the health department in uh, Pune, the uh, uh, Pune, uh, uh, PMC was the, they were ready to cooperate and with the help of uh, the current chief secretary who is uh, Sujada Saunik, uh, we were able to get the data and the permissions to work on that. Yeah. So once we have the health data, it was quite easy because we have the climate data, we have the rainfall, the temperature, yeah. the humidity, mm -hmm. all those parameters uh, uh, which affect the dengue cycle, and we have that for. You know, on a daily basis since 1900, on a daily basis at a high resolution for any city or any district across India, wow. hmm. which means that we are just waiting for that health data from uh, from another city to you know fit this Make data together. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And then once we have this, uh, we had uh, uh, we tested different uh, uh, machine learning methods or artificial intelligence tools uh, to fit this data because the uh, dependence between uh, these weather parameters and the disease is not linear. There, it's not direct. Yeah, it's a combination or, or interconnected relation between rainfall, temperature, and humidity, mm. and their patterns. Even within rainfall, different patterns affect uh, the dengue incidences. Yeah. So all this uh, we were able to, you know, work out through this machine learning method train and test this model and then we were able to get sufficient accuracy in um, uh, in replicating or forecasting the dengue, dengue cycle and the mortality as well. So, uh, Dr. Oxy, if we could ask you, one aspect I was a little confused about was that this model, yeah. as you've said, looks into the future. It can yeah. essentially predict for you. But one mm -hmm. of the tricky things with climate change that we talk about a lot is the fact that climate change means more freak incidents. So, in a sense, less predictability of the kind of weather changes, the big patterns you're going to see. Right. So, right. then how do you make those predictions, especially over the long term? Well, uh, you are right that the weather is getting more and more chaotic, especially the tropic, tropical weather is fast moving, quickly developing weather systems. Hmm. Yeah. But here the model and the forecast uh, depend on the average seasonal cycle. Uh, for example, whether uh, you will in general have uh, moderate rainfall spread through the season uh -huh. or hmm. uh, more, more number of extreme rainfall events or whether the average temperature conditions or the number of days where the temperature is above this conducive conditions, yeah. And that, uh, uh, even in the future, we see that uh, we are able to predict that and uh, we will be able to predict the dengue cycle also based on that. So mm. that's, that's not a major issue with this.
I thought the coolest thing here though was that you've said that it will potentially be applicable to other diseases too. It isn't just dengue. Can you talk a little bit about that? How this can expand even in different countries you've said there is a potential to expand this. What would that look yes, like? Yes, 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 yes. So uh, there are many other climate sensitive diseases like dengue, uh, chikungunya, malaria, mm. uh, yellow fever, uh, you probably even Zika virus. So many of these are vector-borne diseases uh, spread by mosquitoes and, uh, you know, uh, uh, changes in rainfall cycle and temperature and humidity and all affect the cycle yeah, of these uh, vector-borne diseases. So it's quite possible if you have the data for those diseases, we can do a similar kind of, with the same framework, we can develop an early warning system and future projections for these diseases as well. And uh, this is applicable for not just Pune, but across India, where we have uh, monsoonal conditions, or for other countries, nearby countries in South Asia or mm. in the Indo-Pacific, which is which has a tropical climate similar to India, yeah, where the rainfall uh, variability is like this with monsoonal conditions and temperatures are tropical temperatures above 25, 27 degrees Celsius or 30 degrees Celsius. Mm. Yeah. In fact, it is it was quite hot in Pune yesterday. Last last night it was hot. Uh, I think we had one of the warmest Januarys in Pune, yeah, ever recorded. Yeah. So this shows that the climatic conditions are changing. They are becoming more conducive for this kind of tropical diseases. Mm. And it is high time that we work on this. Yeah, mm. we need we need the entire uh, <clears throat> community to work together, share the data, so that we can make more of these kind of uh, early warning systems, which can save lives. Right. I love, Professor, I have to say, uh, right from the beginning of this interview, your big emphasis is we need to share data. Different departments across the country need to share data to make this possible. So can you just tell us, Professor, how exactly does the system predict? So what we mean when we say that is, if, for example, the city of Pune now adopts the system properly, what will it mean? How specific will the prediction be? Will it say between this day and this day we're going to see a dengue outbreak? Will it say which parts of Pune? Exactly what does the model tell you? So there are multiple uh, provisions uh, if we adopt the model. Uh, one thing is uh, we can predict in advance. Yeah, because there is a lag between the weather conditions and how uh, the mosquito larvae develops. And you, mm. you need to have multiple cycles of mosquito population develop so that there is a, uh, enough threshold of uh, or enough number of mosquito population and then the virus has to develop in the uh, mosquitoes uh, which is called uh, extrinsic incubation then it, it has to uh, bite a human and then uh, there is uh, intrinsic incubation uh, which is inside the humans so which means that it gives a long period for predicting uh, after, uh, for example, uh, rainfall or temperature conditions are developed. So that gives us about two months advance period yeah, for a city like Pune. For other regions, it might be different based on the weather temperature conditions and the other socioeconomic conditions over there as well. Yeah. So this gives us uh, two months advance time to tell for the coming season, upcoming monsoon season, for example, maybe in uh, uh, April, May, we can say by June, July, uh, with the onset of the monsoon, if the dengue uh, cases will be high, whether it will be above a particular percentile, above the 75th percentile or not, or will it be lower, so that uh, uh, adequate precautions can be taken, whether it is uh, mosquito uh, fogging or other kind of, uh, you know, removing the water containers from the city and making sure that the mosquito uh, uh, populations are under control. So these kind of precautions can be taken and also we can map the hotspots within the city as well, hmm. yeah, where the dengue cases would be high. So all this is possible with more and more data coming in. And that would essentially mean that if you're able to predict the hotspots, uh, any authorities can already be proactive about the way in which they treat those hotspots, right? Carry out basic exactly. hygiene and sanitary practices. They can divert resources practices. to that, those regions. They can divert those resources to those regions instead of the regions where the dengue will, will be low. Yeah. Okay. And uh, can I just ask you, Professor, before we let you go, the next question, we're going to step away from dengue. You talked right in the beginning about the importance of 
all scientists, researchers, professors to approach whatever they do in an interdisciplinary manner. You said that's why this came about. Can I almost ask you, when it comes to climate science, which is what you do, what you specialize in, dengue is one way in which health and climate science can be tied together. Where are the other ways in which climate science can unlock secrets? If, for example, you were given an endless budget and you could research many, many different interlinking and connections. Yeah, yeah. So, so many examples. Agriculture, for example, the crops. Uh, we saw that, uh, like in 2022, uh, heat wave season, the entire North India was impacted by heat waves. And uh, what we call as compound extreme events are happening. So uh, uh, there is dry season uh, so and deficit in rainfall due to climate change. On top of that, we have heat waves and then there is pollution also. So all these factors compounding together and impacting agriculture. So we saw that the grain size were 20% lower in those years and India had even reduce the import of uh, wheat grains from the country during mm. during that time. Yeah, mm. that's one example. Stock market actually uh, is impacted uh, through agriculture. Uh, mm. One example is impacted by because uh, and we see that even when during the forecast time itself. So April, May, we have the forecast from the India Meteorological Department on how the next season, monsoon season would be. And depending on that, large scale farmers ready their fields so depending on if the forecast is good or bad they will decide how much of uh, area they will cultivate for that e uh, for that year and based mm -hmm. on that they will buy the fertilizers and all yeah so these kind of uh, cascading impacts are there for climate and climate variability and climate change as well these are just some examples um there are impacts on the fisheries sector uh because uh we see that the uh, warming in the oceans, that is one part of my study, warming in the oceans reduce the phytoplankton, the microscopic plants in the mm -hmm, ocean, mm -hmm, yeah, mm -hmm. which are like the base of the food chain mm. and affect the, you know, the upper part of the food chain as well. And you, you would ideally have reduced uh, fish catch due to that or impacts on coral so bleaching. So it's almost the ripple effects that we yeah, see starting out at the very base is what you're saying, yeah. the phytoplankton on the very base, and then you see it sort of ripple through. Professor, exactly. thank you. Thank you so much for just joining us, for shedding a light on this topic, but also just taking our conversation to so many different other places. All right, we hope we've left you. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Professor. Decision. Thank you. Okay, we'd like to thank you, Professor. We'd also like to thank uh, our audiences just for staying with us through that. It was a slightly meatier topic. We wanted to pull apart the new research that they've done. Now, we're going to head into a quick break. 